family in 1840. The Robertsons are a pioneer family living on a backwoods farm in 1840. Although the Robertsons are a fictional family, their struggle to clear the forest, to plant, to harvest, and to make a good life for themselves echoes the efforts of our early settlers who worked hard to build a home, a community, and a country. The Robertsons, like real settlers, live by this motto, eat it up, wear it out, make it do, or go without. Willie, Granny, Sarah, Ma Robertson, Pa Robertson. The Robertson children learn early that many hands make light work and that it's best to make hay while the sun shines. But life isn't all chores and making do. Maple sugar frolics and harvest suppers, husking bees and barn dances, the birth of lambs and the search for a honey tree brighten the days as the seasons pass from winter to spring, from summer to fall. Frolics. A frolic is something fun, such as a party. George, Meg and Tommy, Lizzie. Harvesting the crops. Stand up properly, Meg said. You can't carry water all hunched over like that. Willie wiggled his shoulders to make the yoke sit more comfortably, then straightened up. The weight of the buckets made the wood bite into the back of his neck. It hurts, he complained. Stop fidgeting. Meg moved the yoke slightly and the pressure eased. You'll be fine. It's a lot easier than lugging a bucket by hand. And you won't lose nearly so much water. Off you go. The men will be dying of thirst. Carrying water out to the hayfield had always been Meg's or George's job. This year, Pa wanted George's help with the harvesting, and Ma had decided that Willie and Sarah were big enough to carry water. Stupid buckets, Willie grumbled to himself as he trudged off. I want to do real work, like George. That reminded him of George sitting at the grindstone last evening, making me turn the handle while he sharpened the sickle. Thinks he's so important just because Pa's letting him help cut the hay this year. The sun beat down from a blue sky. Pa had been right about the weather. Listen to those cicadas sing, he'd said the night before. We'll have good haying weather tomorrow. Willie rested his hands on the bucket handles to keep them from swinging and arched his back against the weight. Across the fields, he could see Pa and one of the big Simpson boys who'd been hired on for the summer. They swayed back and forth as they swung the long-handled scythes to cut the hay. George was bent over using the short-handled sickle to trim around a tree stump. Every so often, Pa stopped and ran a whetstone over his scythe blade. Willie liked the raspy zroop of the whetstone sharpening the blade. The stubble of cut grass prickled Willie's bare feet as he crossed the field. The soles of his feet were toughened from months of running barefoot. But with the buckets dragging him down, the stubble felt sharp and he was anxious about tripping over an upthrust stone and spilling the water, or, worse still, stepping on a snake. With luck, the snakes would all be gone. Just yesterday, he and George had been out with sticks, beating the field to scare away snakes and families of skunks and rabbits. Last thing I want, Pa had said, is animals exploding out of the grass in front of me when I'm swinging a scythe. Like to cut a foot off. Ah, here he is. Pa straightened and stretched. Time for a rest, boys. Willie lowered the buckets carefully to the uneven ground, shrugged off the yoke, and handed around the gourds he'd brought as water dippers. Now that you're here, Pa said, you can stay a while and spread some of that hay. 
can't spare anyone from the cutting till we're further along. George smirked, licked a finger, and flicked it across the sharp edge of the sickle, as though to say, I'm indispensable. You can do the baby work. Willie waited till Pa's back was turned, then stuck out his tongue at George. It wasn't much, but it made him feel a little better. In the afternoon, Ma and the girls came out to help. Finally, at the end of a long, hot day, Pa said, Well, we've done our best. Let's hope the sun does its best. For two days, the sun baked and dried the hay. On the third morning, the whole family turned out to rake it into windrows to make loading the sledge easier. Up and down the fields they went, competing with one another to make straight, even rows. A thing worth doing is worth doing well, Ma always said. Several times during the morning, Willie or Sarah went back to the house to get buckets of cool water, to which Granny had added a handful of oatmeal to make a thirst-quenching drink. As Willie trudged out once more with the water buckets, he looked up at the sky. Clouds like balls of carded wool were rolling in, but they were high and white. No danger from rain there. After the noon meal, Pa walked the oxen and sledge out to the field. Pitching hay onto the sledge was hard work for Willie. His arms weren't strong enough to throw a forkful to the top of the load. More often than not, his stalks slithered off. Finally, Pa, who was up on top building the load, said, Willie, you take charge of the oxen. Keep moving them forward as we work along this row. The afternoon dragged on. One load was safely back at the barn with another still to come. Ma and Meg were pitching hay now, while Sarah carted water. Back at the barn, Pa and George were starting to build the haystack. Hour after hour, Willie inched the oxen along the rows, watching out for stones and roots and stumps. Every now and then, he scanned the sky. The woolly clouds bunched and drifted into fantastic shapes, and Willie's mind drifted with them. A bear and her cub lumbered across the sky. A dainty pony skipped by. Then fat fish blowing bubbles. A gray whale. Gray? Ma, look, rain clouds. Ma took one quick look at the sky and said, Get those oxen moving, Willie. We've got to get this load under cover. Dainty. Something that is dainty is delicate. Hey, yup, Willie shouted, and the oxen started a steady plod. Low clouds scudded in, darker with each second. Ma and Meg frantically raked windrows into small haycocks. In piles, at least the bottommost stalks would stay dry. Willie concentrated on the sledge. Gee, Buck, gee, Bright, he shouted to steer the oxen around roots and stumps. As the sky grew darker, he prodded the animals with the goad. Move, move, he urged them. The oxen blew through their nostrils and plodded steadily ahead. Never was such a stubborn beast as an ox, his father always said. Willie could see Pa and George beside the barn. They swung their arms in rhythm oblivious to everything but the orderly layering of the haystack. Then he felt a drop of water. Pa, he screeched, rain, rain. The sudden noise started bright off at a trot, with his partner snorting beside him. Pa and George wrenched open the big barn doors, and just as the clouds burst, the sledge skidded under cover. Good work, Willie. Pa said as they all crowded into the barn. You saved that load. You've got a real farmer's eye for weather. Plod. To plod is to move heavily and slowly. Oblivious. If someone is oblivious, they swung their arms in rhythm, oblivious to everything.
Willie glowed with pride. For the next few days, as he worked, he pictured over and over his mad dash for the barn until it grew into a story of heroic proportions. When Uncle Jacob Burkholder came over to show Pa how to thatch a waterproof roof for their haystack, Willie regaled him with the whole tale. Well, now, that's quite a feat, moving cattle beasts along like that. Mind you, nothing like a drop of rain to get a man moving. Uncle Jacob laughed as he wove the last of the straw into the roof. Now I remember when I was a young'un, no older than you, we saw a dilly of a storm heading up. My brother and I were running around fastening shutters and bolting doors when we heard a tarnation big racket headed our way. Up our lane came a farm rig, horses running like Jehu, all wild-eyed and foaming at the mouth, wagon bouncing along behind like a pea on a hot skillet. Run away, my brother shouts. Then we hear the driver screaming, open the doors, open the doors. We jumped pretty smart, I can tell you. Swung open those big barn doors, and he drove the whole rig in just seconds before a great crack of thunder. And did those clouds pour rain. I looks in the wagon and sees three hundred weight of flour in linen sacks. A few drops of rain and the whole lot would have caked solid. That man never was any good at reading the weather, Uncle Jacob ended scornfully. Well, there's your stack roofed in. No fear of rain getting through that. Ma had been busy, too. While she was listening to Uncle Jacob's story, she'd bound a handful of hay into the shape of a rooster. Here, Willie, she said. Scoot up and stick that on top. It'll dress up the stack for us. Good idea, Uncle Jacob beamed, and I'll show you how to rig it up as a weather vane, so's you'll be warned the next time a storm blows up. Proportions When you talk about the proportions of something, you talk about its size. Regaled If you regaled someone, you entertained them. Harvesting The hot days of summer brought hard work for the whole family. The Robertsons had two hayfields. One they had cleared themselves. The other was a beaver meadow. Long before the Robertsons arrived on the land, beavers had dammed the river and flooded several acres. The trees died, the water dried up, and grass grew. Early settlers were delighted to find beaver meadows on their farms because they provided instant fodder, food, for oxen and cows. The hay would feed the animals through the winter, but the people needed wheat. In fact, the wheat harvested one year had to last until the next. By the first week of August, the wheat was ready to be cut. The men were out in the fields with their scythes again, and Willie and Sarah were running back and forth with water. As the men cut the wheat, Mrs. Robertson and Meg followed behind tying the stalks of grain into bundles called sheaves. Ten sheaves propped up against one another formed a stook. Wheat was a precious crop, and the family worked long into the night to get it safely under cover. Mr. Robertson and the hired help packed it carefully into mows, storage lofts, in the barn to keep it safe and dry until they had time to thresh it. Harvesting wasn't all hard work. Sometimes neighbors helped one another bring in the crops. This harvesting bee often finished with a party. The men set up long tables in the fields, and the women brought out food for a harvest supper. To amuse the children, Mr. Burkholder built a maze out of sheaves of grain. Thresh to thresh a plant is to beat it in order to separate its grain or seeds from the rest of the plant. Harvest Moon Farmers planned to harvest when the moon was full, so that they had enough light to work until midnight if necessary. In September, 
the full moon seems to linger in the sky for several nights in a row. This happens because moonrise comes only 20 minutes later each night, instead of the usual 50 minutes. No wonder the September full moon was the harvest moon. Full moons were useful all year round. Many farmers believed that crops planted at certain phases of the moon would grow better. To escape the heat of the day, farmers often did their planting and hoeing in the cool of the night by the light of the moon. In winter, travelers planned long journeys for times when the full moon would give them extra light to get home through the dark forest. Reading the weather. Thanks to the weather forecasts, you can make plans, not just for tomorrow, but for the whole week. Pioneers didn't receive reports from meteorologists. They predicted good and bad weather by watching for signals in the world around them. Try the pioneer method of forecasting the weather. Signs of good weather are birds flying high, smoke rising quickly, cicadas singing loudly, and heavy dew at night. Watch the clouds. The higher they are, the better the weather will be. These signs mean wet weather's coming, smoke curling downward, dark cumulus or cotton ball clouds, overcast cirrus or long stringy clouds. A halo around the sun means rain within 10 to 12 hours. <laughs>